have a chance now to ask some devastating questions um, and that have been suggested to me and others I've thought up. And I want to go with almost with the theme that Marla ended up with, but also that Steve had throughout his presentation, is this was this construct observation of variability, heterogeneity, diversity in the patient population. And at times you think that's going to end up being chaos, and yet at the same time, I wonder, and, and I got some suggestion from Steve's presentation as well as from Marla's, is there in the heterogeneity, in that diversity, in the variability in the presentation, is there a diamond? Is there something there that's important? Steve, and I'm going to turn to you on that. Um, yeah, yes, but not always. <laughs> that, that's what we do as scientists. We look for outliers to kind of guide the way forward and develop hypotheses. So <clears throat> I can think of a few examples, um, which I did not show. Actually, I took one of the slides out just before my presentation. <clears throat> Um, I mentioned the, the one region that's a copy number variant uh, that's been defined for many years. Um, it's a region on human chromosome 7. I studied this in my PhD thesis. <clears throat> and if you're missing one copy of this 1.6 million chemical based region on chromosome 7, it encompasses 16 genes. You have a disorder called Williams syndrome, Williams Buren syndrome. And it's very, very predictable of what the outcome is, including the behavioral outcome. And then more recently, it's been found that if you have three copies of that gene, it's, you seem to have a neurodevelopmental condition that is very reminiscent of autism and that what some people are now actually calling autism. So too much leads you in one trajectory and too little leads you in a different trajectory. Uh, these are pretty predictable. So in a way, I do think, I, I agree with what Marla said, uh, but I also, I think we have to remember that we are our DNA is a blueprint, but we're very hardwired. That's why you look like your father, and you look like your mother. <laughs> That's controlled by the genes. Uh, so, um, but, but it's true, we, in, the, in the pursuit of scientific investigation, we follow these types of leads. And I, I gave you one example. There's lots of others. We have some unpublished data now where um, we're getting a little bit more specificity. I was talking about it today in my presentation at the meeting. Um, we're getting more specificity as we increase the resolution and we have these new technologies that get us down to the specific genetic alteration, not just kind of an assumption of where it might be. And if we have good clinical details, we can make much more positive correlations. So um, I think there are examples, more examples coming. But it's not a perfect science. I mean, we're studying behavior here with all of its complexities. Marla, does anything, <coughs> did you want to add anything to that for me based on your comments or... Are you okay with that? And I will go to another question. I would say that for behavior, I wouldn't say want to say that we're hardwired uh, as much as maybe some uh, physical characteristics. Sorry. I would say that the term of hardwired in a DNA blueprint, um, one has to think about which particular traits you're talking about. And so for something, like a physical characteristic, having a hitchhiker's thumb or not, I don't. It's a single gene trait, or some traits that are single gene that we know about, like Huntington's disease or cystic fibrosis, then we can talk about a genetic blueprint. But when we're talking about traits like normal variation in behavior, and maybe some of the behavioral traits um, for some of these disorders, it isn't a one-to-one -one mapping necessarily of gene and behavior, we have mutations in a, in a, in one, an autism gene, and yet it's not completely penetrant, right? That that child doesn't end it up with it. So the genetic gives us a predisposition, but I think we don't want to give up on understanding things about the environment that could be interacting somehow with that predisposition. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. That would be that's my what I said. Just, I'm just leaning. I mean, we, we know through behavioral studies in animals and in humans that we are hardwired. Maybe, maybe a better term is we're softwired. Uh, but, but in fact, a lot, of, uh, a lot of things, and each of us can tell stories about our spouses, but you know, my spouse would say, you're stubborn, you got it from your dad. <laughs> and I have many attributes that are uh, probably hardwired based on my genetics. And so you couldn't change your stubbornness? You don't no, I can. I have no control. <laughs> <of that. laughs> and this is how science advances. This is we've had two days of this. <laughs> A little more sophisticated than no, you're not. No, that one doesn't. 
that argument is, is uh, as, well, it does come out every now and then in science. So I, I, want, to, uh, I want to go to Evdokia. Evdokia, you're a clinician, um, yet you're, you're leading this, this, the PON network. And how is basic science going to assist you or assist clinical work in general? What's, why? Why basic science? Well, uh, I'm a neurologist, and when I was training my supervising neurologist, every time I saw a child, he would say, where is the lesion? So we got trained to identify the lesion. You know, if a kid had a stroke, you looked for the signs of the stroke, and then you figured out where in the brain that stroke localized. When I saw a child with autism spectrum disorder, my supervisor asked me, where is the lesion? And I had no idea where the lesion was and very quickly realized that without understanding where the lesion is, there is very little opportunity for innovative therapeutic development, for, for making big improvements in the way we treat kids because we don't understand the biology. We don't understand the lesion. So what basic science does for me is it gives me a lesion. Once we have the lesion, once we know what the molecular target is, the biological target is, then we have tools and there is huge technology development happening at the same time that allows us to get much better at developing new tools to actually develop treatments that target that lesion. But we need the lesion. Right, so lesion as a metaphor. As a metaphor. For, for understanding the mechanism. Absolutely. What's, what's underneath, yes. which is the issue. And I think if you think a bit about the debate that, that Stephen Marlowe was happening, it was exactly that, I think, back and forth, understanding the mechanism, the hardwire, with what's happening on how you interface with how this is expressed. And I think that may be another way of, of phrasing that. Marla, I, wanna, I, I want you to think big. Where are the breakthroughs going to come through? Where, where, how do we get them? Where, do, where, where are we going to go? So I think one of the things that has to be done, and I know it's, it's um, being started already, is to bring people from wide, wildly different fields and areas together who wouldn't normally find themselves in the same room at any meeting to work at the edges of their discipline. It sounds like a CIFAR model, but to really push them um, to address the questions. And... That way, um, and it's the same in, in my lab, you, you get out of your rut of thinking in a certain way and you, you hope to make um, big innovative discoveries. So I would say that's how to do it and there are many groups starting to do that, including at, here in Toronto at SickKids. Right, in, in other words, thinking differently about approaches and sometimes we need to have the conflict to be able to say yeah, which is one or the other and why, why essentially why our workshop for two days was to bring in people of diverse backgrounds. Steve, I'm going to go back to you, and I am going to end up then, Evdokia, with a devastating question for Evdokia that, that we're all dying to ask, but so I'm letting her prepare herself there. But Steve, I, I want to go back to you, the thing that you said, because uh, I'm a neuropsychologist. You described the whole issue of behavior, and you talked about the diversity from the social cognition versus the, quote, executive. And in my domain, um, that would be, both of those are related to frontal lobe functioning. This is the area of research I do. And yet, we've also taken a look at, and we've heard over the two days, this whole issue of networks and systems. Um, so talk to me, I mean, even though it's not your field, so how do you see that area pursuing, or do you feel that, that I mean, that's not a fair question to ask you? <clears throat> That's definitely not a fair question to ask. <laughs> I told you. I told you I was going to ask. Why don't you talk? This is your area of expertise. <laughs> maybe, maybe what I, I will say is, um, you know, I, I, I presented a, a presentation of the things that really excite me. And, and I think we've seen more progress in the last few years uh, that have really revolutionized the way we think about autism. Okay. I think the, uh, <clears throat> the concept of molecules meeting at the synapse and the development of animal mo models based on human mutations that now seem to be reversed by in phenotype using specific drugs or training behaviors and things. So I think this is really exciting. It's what we've been looking for. But in saying all of that, we've been looking under the lamppost. Um, we have these massive data sets that we can generate by genomics, proteomics, imaging, um, and we tend to look for things that we find simple or can explain. So maybe I'll, I'm being a politician here, I'm changing your question to come back to the question you asked Marla. Um, 
really, uh, and this is what I, 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 uh, I think the, the um, reason for the meeting was, is to bring uh, mathematicians and statisticians and um, modeling people to, to the fore so that we can actually really start to understand um, the depth of the data and what it should be telling us as opposed to looking for what we think it should be telling us. So that's where we need. That was my last slide. And then that's where the breakthroughs are going to come at the interface of these disciplines right. and thinking about new ideas. Uh, so, for example, in autism, you know, why are we studying males so much? I mean, we have four to one male, we do a collection. We should really be studying females because perhaps the clue at Shank One family I talked about is trying to find the genes that are protective, right? Mm -hmm. That'll give us the clue of actually developing treatments, maybe easier to protect than actually replace or correct. So uh, those types of bright ideas coming from bright people, but I think using different approaches uh, and, pr and, and exploiting the massive data sets that we can develop technically, but actually bringing them to completion. Uh, no, and I, uh, that actually is a kind of an answer that I wanted, and I just, as an aside, and it wasn't an unfair question I was asking Steve, but one of the constructs is, is about thinking broadly, is that some of the work that I've done, I've actually borrowed from the autism research to do in, in adults with stroke. So this idea of, of pushing the boundaries across and you can borrow from every, anywhere to come across with ideas that help you to understand the question that, that, that you're pursuing and the patient population that you're pursuing. So I, I think you're, you're spot on with, uh, with, your, with your response. Now I'm going to ask Evdoki the question that everybody wants me to ask, that everybody's dying, is that is, will, there, will there ever be a cure? Uh, um. <laughs> So, I mean, it is, it's a theoretical possibility, but I don't think that should be the focus for a couple of reasons. One is our brains, the brains of kids who have autism spectrum disorders get wired differently from the beginning. So by the time a baby is born, their, ba their brain is wired differently. So it's extremely unlikely that we're going to have manipulations that we do after birth that would reverse the original wiring. That's one way to look at it. The second way to look at it is you may not want to change it. So we're all wired a little bit differently. It produces variability, it produces innovation, produces some conflict. Then when it gets generated, good things happen. Um, so we don't really want to be all the same. We don't want to get rid of all the differences. What we want to do is we want to decrease the stress, we want to decrease dysfunction, we want to improve quality of life. So the purpose of, of our treatment strategies should be to allow the difference but take away the distress. So it is not like a, a person who is not particularly socially motivated will become a social butterfly after the treatment. It's just that we want the person who's not socially motivated and is feeling and, and is really um, becoming a little bit of an outcast to have the ability to interact, to have the ability to have an interview, to have the ability to get a job that actually matches their skills, to have the ability to get satisfaction out of their life. So I think the goal should be focusing on quality of life and, and removal of distress and less on whether in one day it would be theoretically possible to cure the disease. Thank you. Steve, did you want to? Well, I, you know, I don't disagree with anything that she said, I, but there are parents who want their child treated towards a cure. Uh, certainly uh, severely autistic conditions that are medical genetic disorders that can lead to um, a very debilitating lifestyle. So I don't think we should forget that also. In fact, that really drives our research forward. We want to understand all the things I talked about, but ultimately we want to provide better treatment options for these people who really need to have medical help. help. On the entire spectrum from what you've said well, to what... Uh, this is the absolute challenge in the field. Right. I mean, we're dealing with, um, as I showed in my slide, a disorder that ranges from a Glenn Gould to a severe medical genetic disorder. 